All right, welcome to everyone who has joined so far. As an attendee, you are in listen-only mode and your video is turned off. We'll get started with today's presentation right after this short two-minute video sharing more information about domesticshelters.org. There are over 10 million online searches each month for information regarding domestic violence in just the U.S. and Canada. Anyone, regardless of gender, sexuality, race, or religion, can experience abuse. Domestic abuse isn't always physical violence. It can be emotional, verbal, even financial. It can feel isolating and hopeless. For victims, it often takes several attempts to escape an abusive partner. There are many reasons victims are often afraid to reach out for help, including embarrassment or denial, being isolated from family and friends, or fear of losing their children. But if you're experiencing abuse, you're not alone. It's not your fault. Help is here for you. DomesticShelters.org is the leading domestic violence online resource where abuse victims and survivors can find everything they need to take steps towards safety, all in one place. With DomesticShelters.org's searchable database of domestic violence programs and shelters in the U.S. and Canada, Anyone can find a nearby trained advocate who cares, along with support and resources. Victims of abuse may not be ready to connect with an advocate yet, but with DomesticShelters.org's comprehensive library of relevant and high-quality content, it's simple to find information that can help change lives for the better. Domestic violence professionals and advocates rely on DomesticShelters.org for ways to better support their local communities through free online expert-led training, award and grant programs, donation tools, and other powerful resources. The profound impact of domestic violence hurts everyone. Victims lose hope. Children suffer lifelong trauma. Communities are permanently damaged. That's why millions of people come to DomesticShelters.org to get the answers and help that they need. And why 8 out of 10 DomesticShelters.org visitors share their newfound knowledge with others, exponentially increasing public awareness of abuse. Your support helps connect those millions of victims and survivors of domestic violence with the resources they need to wherever you are on your journey. Please visit us at domesticshelters.org. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Ashley Rumschlank. I am the CEO and president of DomesticShelters.org and Teresa's Fund. I am joined today uh, by our um, by Rachel Myers, our Senior Digital Services Specialist, and Hannah Craig, our VP of Content. Uh, Rachel and Hannah will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A throughout the presentation. We are so excited today to have Sybil come in here to talk about post-separation abuse. Uh, we're expecting a full house today, so if someone on your team isn't able to join, uh, just please ask them to visit our Facebook page where we will be streaming this live. Um, we'll be monitoring the chat there as well, so if there's any questions, we'll make sure that, sure that those get to Sybil. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, so we do have live closed captions available for today's presentation. To enable those, please click more in the, uh, the Zoom toolbar menu and select show subtitles. We will also provide a transcript of today's presentation within one week. All right, and just a few reminders uh, that as a Zoom webinar, you are in listen-only mode, so your microphone and your camera are turned off. Um, as you have questions for Sybil, please put those in the Q&A box, uh, and then we'll we'll send those to her, to, or we'll, we'll present those to her at the end of today's presentation. And then uh, for the chat, please, you can use that to communicate with other attendees, share feedback and thoughts along the way. And just a reminder <clears throat> that um, we do anticipate there'll be a lot of chat today. Uh, we know this can sometimes be distracting. So just a reminder that you can turn off the chat and chat notifications on the Zoom toolbar. Um, so find the chat button in the Zoom toolbar, click on the little uh, upside down arrow, or excuse me, upside down V, uh, and next to that, you can uncheck the show chat previous option. Uh, to close the chat box, just simply click the X on the chat window. <clears throat> excuse me. All right. 
And just a reminder that certificates of attendance, transcript, webinar pay playback recording, as well as additional resources, including the slides, uh, will be sent to everyone within one week of the presentation. Typically, we get those out uh, exactly one week on the following Thursday. All right, and a reminder of our next upcoming webinar, which is going to be on April 6th with Rachel Ramirez from the Ohio Domestic Violence Network. Uh, she's going to be back once again uh, to talk about uh, traumatic brain injury, strangulation, and domestic violence. So um, Rachel will drop a link to, the, to sign up for that one in the chat. All right, and then another reminder that uh, all of our webinars are always free and available uh, to replay later on on our website. So just go to domesticshelters.org slash webinars. And if you would like to uh, request a certificate of attendance, our email is info at domesticshelters.org. Just send us a note and we'll link you to the appropriate uh, uh, folders to download that information. All right. And one last thing, just a big thank you to Thread Talk for supporting this webinar. Uh, Thread Talk founder and domestic violence survivor Hannah K. Herdlinger created her company to empower women and support domestic violence shelters across the country. A certified B corporation, they often they offer high quality, oversized throw blankets, small blankets, and cozy products to give back to those who need it most. Ten percent of every purchase is donated to domesticshelters.org to fund critical wish list items of domestic violence shelters in the U.S. Uh, we are so grateful for their ongoing partnership. Uh, and to date, Thread Talk has donated over $27,000 in items to shelters with wish lists on domesticshelters.org. Okay, and here we are. So we're so grateful to have Sybil coming here today. Uh, I met Sybil, uh, let's see, I, I believe that she was very active in our Facebook group. And we just, she was saying all these wonderful things and I knew I had to meet her. Uh, and from the moment I met her, I was really looking forward to this specific day because I, I have been trying to get her in here to do a webinar with us uh, probably since our first conversation. But Sybil is a wealth of information and has a unique background as a mental health professional who also has a deep understanding of domestic violence. Um, I know you have a lot of information to cover today, Sybil, in the next 80 or 85 minutes. So uh, without further ado, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. It's an area I'm really passionate about. And yeah, I came into this a little bit differently than um, a lot of people in our field. And it's, um, yeah, it's just really important to me to do this, this work and to share this with you all. So I'm going to try and share my slides with you. All right, I am hoping you all can see that um, and everything's good to go. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to let all of you know, listening, I um, am really grateful for all the questions you did send me. I'm so glad we did that. Um, I really tried to make sure that I answered as many of them as possible within the presentation because I know, first of all, I've got the gift of gab, so I can just like keep going on and on about this. Um, I am gonna try and watch the time so I have some room for questions. Um, and then there's also some questions that I can't answer exactly because um, there's so much nuance to individual situations. So if you had an individual question about your court case, your kids, um, things like that, it's a lot harder and may not be the appropriate venue to answer your specific question within um, this large group. Um, I want to be really cognizant and respectful of your personal information. So um, I have a couple of poll questions that I would love to ask you all, just so I know who I'm talking to, um, because I could you know, be talking to people who have long-term time with their clients like myself, or I could be talking with people who have 30 to 90 days. So um, the first poll question is, what best describes your role in working with victims and survivors of domestic violence? This can just help me um, kind of tailor my um, discussion and my presentation to you. So if you can go ahead and fill that out, it'll be really helpful for me. I'm sure it'll just be a moment for everyone to do that. Mm 
And then I assume Ashley, it'll just like pop up for me when I'm done. That's how it worked for me in the past. I'm going to go ahead and end it. I usually try to hit 75. We just hit 77. Perfect. Perfect. And share results. Perfect. So we've got a lot of advocates with us, which is kind of what I was thinking. Um, some mental health professionals, legal. Um, we've actually got everybody um, kind of that I had asked about on this list. Um, so that is really helpful. And um, then the next question is really specific to post-separation abuse. Um, so kind of what area or what best describes the post-separation abuse um, behavior that has the most impact on who you work with every day, or if this is you um, and you're a survivor here with us, what impacts you the most? And you might wish that it wasn't a single choice answer and that you could click all of them. Um, but I definitely want to speak to the things that'll help you the most in this presentation. All right, we'll just give it another moment here at about 60%. Lots of people still answering here. Yeah, and it could be really it could be really hard to know, especially if you don't know a lot about post-separation abuse and that's why you're here. You may, you may not know which one of these or if there are even other ones that are really negatively affecting your clients. Um, and that's what I'm hoping to give you today is just a really good um, basis of knowledge so that you can help your people that you're working with. All right, sharing results. Okay, so this is not surprising to me. Um, so the winner is using children to further abuse. Um, and so lucky for you all, that is actually where my specialty lies is within the legal abuse, um, how legal abuse is used in post-separation abuse and how children are used to further abuse. So wonderful, <laughs> it's not wonderful because that's not good that that's what people are experiencing, but I am glad that I can be here to help. So I really want, this is really important to me to bring this up because um, post-separation abuse is a really, really huge thing. And it comes for people who don't even know that they are being abused. Um, it comes um, you know, with you know, toxic relationships or um, you know, they, they aren't going to subscribe to the language of domestic violence or intimate partner violence that doesn't fit for them because there was never any physical abuse. And we all know that that's not what encapsulates domestic violence or intimate partner violence. And it is really important for us to be aware of that language is really important. Um, so these are just some quotes from people that I have worked with on their kind of thoughts or experience of post-separation abuse. So I had to walk on eggshells throughout my entire marriage and thought I could breathe once I left. I'm still walking on eggshells, but in a different way. Nobody told me that he could continue to abuse me. This abuse scares me more because I am never sure where his mind is at now that I don't live with him. Um, and then this is probably the sentiment that most of my uh, clients or community members say is this kind of abuse is a different kind of hell. And it's one that they weren't aware was coming. So that is why it's really important for me to talk with you all today about that. So I'm not going to go on and on about myself, but just so that you know a little bit about me. So um, I am a licensed professional counselor. Um, I run a small group practice in Colorado. I also run um, a community, an online community for survivors of narcissistic abuse, domestic violence, um, and all of which are experiencing post-separation abuse in some way. And 90 plus percent are experiencing post-separation abuse within family court. Um, I train other mental health professionals. That's really important for me um, because we're not actually trained. <laughs> I was not trained in working with domestic violence at all in my graduate program. I had maybe 30 minutes in my program. Um, and so I had to seek out training elsewhere and fortunately and unfortunately learn from my clients. Um, I'm an author, I'm a speaker, I have a podcast and I have been deemed a squeaky wheel, um, which I am actually very proud of because I'm really passionate about using my privilege to speak out and support those who cannot speak out um, and their voices have been silenced. So I am happy to be a loud mouth and share maybe what you or those that you work with um, 
aren't comfortable sharing or aren't safe, safe sharing. All right. So yeah, we all have to look at some stats and sometimes they're sobering. And um, I don't always like to share the Debbie Downer stuff. And we have to just so that we're really aware of the gravity. So research shows that after separation from an abusive partner, up to 90% of women report continued harassment, stalking, or abuse. Now, I will just the caveat is that a lot of the research, even, you know, within, you know, when you live within the um, an abusive relationship or post-separation is around cis female victims and cis male perpetrators of. Um, we do know that there are higher rates of that. The um, levels of lethality and the risk of lethality is higher, but I definitely want to put out there that women are not the only victims. Men are not the only perpetrators. And as I speak to this a little bit further of like what to look for, or what it can look like, um, I will try and remember to share this is what it might look like for um, a female identifying client in a heterosexual relationship. This is what it may look like for a male where there's a female perpetrator. Um, and I don't work as much with the LGBTQA community um, specifically because they are in family court less. And that's really my area of expertise. Um, but power and control is, is power and control. Um, on average, it takes a victim seven tries to leave. We need to know that. And separation increases the risk of lethality for at, at least one year post-separation. Um, I see it a lot further than that, um, unfortunately, and especially when family court and children are involved. Um, and we, again, we'll talk a lot about that later. So um, survivors who don't know, they have a higher likelihood of losing their children during family court. They're more likely to return to the relationship because the abuse feels worse and it's scarier. It's like the evil you know is um, less scary than the evil you don't. Um, they're going to be stuck in the systems. And when I say systems, I'm thinking family court, child protection, um, any of the larger systems. Um, they're going to be stuck in it for longer and they're going to have a much longer healing journey. Um, those who do know, um, in my experience, they may take longer to leave but they're going to be better prepared when they leave. Um, so I had um, a conversation with an advocate in our area and it just struck me, which is again, why I was like, Ashley, I'm doing this webinar um, is this advocate was fearful of sharing all the things post-separation abuse with the survivors she works with because she had this fear that if they knew they would not leave. And yes, it is so scary. It's like you're leaving and this is horrible and you're, you know, you, there's a lethality risk for you leaving, you know, you're going to escape and guess what? It's not going to be over. That's really horrible to be that person sharing. So there is a sense of getting this person to a place like the night, the first night they're in shelter with you is not the time to be like, okay, now let's talk about post-separation abuse. That's not the best choice, but within that first kind of 30 days, 60 days, they need to start to know. And why is that? This is so important because if we provide these women and, and men, the information, it gives them the autonomy to make their own choice because their choice will be a more educated decision. And I want you to think about these relationships. What is taken from victims of relationship violence or relationship abuse? It's their autonomy. It's their sense of self. They are unable to make choices. They don't understand their reality anymore, right? So their, their autonomy, their body autonomy, what they can wear, who they can be around, um, what they do sexually, what they, their physical, you know, capabilities, all of that is taken from them. And so from a therapist perspective, um, autonomy is really one of the most important things that we can give our clients. So when I'm training mental health professionals that have a longer term um, time with their clients, I really talk about not 
taking over or not replicating the role of power and control of the abuser. And that sounds gross, but if we are telling them to leave or we're telling them to do anything and we are making choice for them, we're not helping them heal. So it's really important for us to give them the information. So sharing information about post-separation abuse, it's going to allow them to know what is the next best step. So for advocates, most of the time, you don't have the length of time. I can work with people for years, but if you don't have years, you have 30 to 90 days to work with someone, your goal isn't like way down there, right? Like the healing process a year from now, your, your goal is like, what is their next, next best step? Knowing what we know about post-separation abuse. And when they do know, they do have better outcomes for their sel- themselves and their children. So what are we talking about? What is post-separation abuse? So post-separation abuse refers, refers to the continued abuse done from a previous intimate partner to their target partner after the relationship is ended. And that, that purpose is to continue holding on to power and control over the target partner Um, And often in a retaliation or or for revenge for leaving the relationship. Um, And so, you know, just because they separate or you leave, that does not mean that that person's like, oh, okay, well, moving on to the next person, they still want to hold power and control over you. And if we look at like the continuum of violence, which I don't have a slide of here, the less control they feel they have the, you know, they're going to up the ante and the intensity of that abuse is going to happen. That doesn't necessarily mean that physical violence is going to happen. Something's going to happen. So um, I am not going to go into depth into this post-separation abuse wheel. Um, Y'all can read, and I'm sure you all have seen this. If you've not seen this, we will make sure that we get this, um, a link to the post-separation abuse wheel for you. Um, And then the other piece, a caveat to any of the wheels, is you can't capture all the possible ways of abuse. So there are things that I would have never thought of that is being used in an abusive way that's not on the wheel from some of my clients, but it is post-separation abuse. Um, I am going to go into the ones that I am the most specialized into in depth. Um, but wanted to put them out there here. So I'm going to go in depth and DV by proxy, um, all the ones of using children against the partner, um, financial abuse and legal abuse are like best friends. So we'll talk about that. I'm going to briefly talk about harassment and stalking. Um, I typically in my community that I run and in my practice, we don't see extreme levels of physical stalking um, as, you know, other, other um, agencies do. Um, But I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, Isolation, got to talk about that. And then the discard, the discard in this um, can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, But I see it the most used with children, with legal abuse. So, so many of these just like overlap. And so it's really hard to just like pull out one of the pies, you know, pieces of the pie of the wheel because they all just work together. And unfortunately they work well. And some more Debbie Downer is that the way our systems are set up now support the abuse to continue. And that's really a hard pill to swallow that the systems that are set up to, you know, in theory to protect um, victims are actually supporting post-separation abuse to continue. All right. So kind of briefly stalking. This is actually really, 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 and all you advocates are like, oh my gosh, yeah, I know this. You're preaching to the choir. It is so hard to get law enforcement to pay any attention to stalking right? Unless it is very dramatic and they're showing up at your home with a gun and sending you threats of, I am going to kill you, which is not actually as typical as what you're going to see. Um, the police or law enforcement may not believe that it's threatening. So stalking really includes unwanted contact through text, phone calls, social media, um, sending unwanted gifts and gifts is kind of a 
a loose term um because a lot of times it's it's not really gifts um showing up at functions showing up, up around the target family friends um one of my young people she's actually a teen um her ex-partner just got a job at the store next to the one in which she works and his um new partner actually just rented um, an apartment in the same complex in which she lives. So law enforcement would not take that seriously. Like they can live wherever they want, they can work wherever they want, but it's something that we need to know in working with this population. Um, they will monitor like location, they will monitor your activities. And very often they're doing it through the kids and the false narrative is, oh my gosh, I love my children so much. I just need to know what they're doing at all times. I just worry because, and this is, you know, mom is, is, you know, mentally unstable. So I just really need to know exactly where they are at any time. So I can save the day gross. And unfortunately that works, that works for a lot of professionals um, who should know this, but, but they don't know this. Um, stalking includes property damage, threats, um, and this has the highest risk of homicide. So what can you do? I'm going to talk a lot more um, at the end of, of the presentation of like, what can you do and how can we support these people? But really focusing on what can you document that can show that this is a threat? So um, are there orders of protection? Yes, a lot of times. Um, so we, you know, I suggest that even if it doesn't seem threatening, if there is a breaking of the order of protection that they do call the police. Now, it totally depends who picks up the phone. And the other thing we need to help our clients understand and be able to monitor and be able to verbalize, right? These um, women and men are traumatized and it's really hard for them to verbalize and speak out against their abusive par um, partner. But it's really helpful for us to help them find ways to verbalize why was this specific thing threatening? And we like to call it the dog whistle, right? It's because we can't hear a dog whistle, but a dog can hear a dog whistle. So some of the things that your, you know, the, the partners or ex-partners will do, if I heard about it, had no idea, it would not seem threatening. And so asking your clients, asking the survivors you're working with, um, how could they verbalize why? So like, why is asking um, about the sprinkler system or breaking an order of protection, going to the ring doorbell and asking about the sprinkler system and have you um, had it blown out yet? Because I'm in Colorado, winters, blow out your sprinklers. Um, why is that threatening? Right? Because the law enforcement are like, uh, yeah, he doesn't want his house to flood. No, because before there was a huge argument where holes were punched in the wall and things happened around the sprinkler system, right? But the law enforcement just gets the snapshot and you're all worked up. So you're talking about a sprinkler system and they're like, wait, what are you talking about? So as an advocate, as a therapist, someone working with them, being able to help them explain the dog whistle and why that is um, threatening to them is really helpful. Again, will they listen to you? Sometimes. Sometimes not, but having things on record will prevent the afterwards. Well, if you were so fearful, why didn't you call the police last time he broke the order of protection? So we have to prevent that questioning later. Isolation. Isolation is going to continue and it might get worse. So the smear campaign is going to be in full force and effect. They are going to tell whatever false narrative that they can to anyone and everyone. That could be people at your job. That could be family and friends. That could be putting it out on Facebook. Um, it will be in the family court system. That is their like shining moment where they have a full captive audience that can't leave, where they get to share the false narrative. They will enlist flying monkeys um, people at their, you know, places of worship can be flying monkeys, family members. Um, all of these people will try and get information about you or will, you know, try and, um, 
you know, have you rethink or not file the motion or not get the order of protection or whatever it might be. By take, taking control of the narrative. So those of you that are advocates, um, this is a little bit different for you, but if you are a caseworker within child protection, you are in the legal system, you are a therapist, maybe you're a couples therapist. By way of take, you know, if the abuser takes control of the narrative and you buy it and you don't question, that continues to silence and isolate the target parent. So really focusing on, you know, finding ways to not allow them to control the narrative is really important. Um, and then isolation is going to happen with the same kind of level of emotional abuse that was done within, you know, when they lived in the relationship. Um, I was told by a client um, at one point that I saw, or that I think her quote was something like, I know that tens of thousands of women are going through this every day through the family court system, but I have never felt so alone. So this, you know, post-separation abuse is really lonely. It's really, really lonely. Okay, let's get into using the children. So I, by training, I am actually a play therapist, a child therapist, and how I got into the world of domestic violence and narcissistic abuse and coercive control is that I was seeing a dynamic with the kids in which I worked in every environment I worked in. So I worked at a hospital, I worked at an agency um, that contracted with child protection and I work in private practice. And in every arena, in every environment, there was this like dynamic I couldn't put my finger on. And what was it? It was domestic violence. It was coercive control. It was using my children here at my practice to continue harm. And that is in fact child abuse as well. However, it's really hard if there isn't physical abuse, sexual abuse, or severe neglect that you can put your finger on um, for anything to happen child protection wise. And if there is a protective parent, so they have separated. And so this you know, parent is seen as protective. They also may not open cases because there is a protective parent. That doesn't say anything about them when they're unsupervised with the non-safe parent, but these are some of the things that we are running into. So counter-parenting. So maybe nutrition has been really important in your family, or maybe you are vegan and you have lived vegan for your child's entire life. You separate, get divorced, and your partner will introduce meat into your child's diet. So things like that. This happens every day, all day. Um, you really want them to focus on school or this, you know, this thing is important and they will counter. Um, and this happens overtly and covertly. Um, domestic violence by proxy, I'm going to jump into and go into detail about that later, but that is when the children, um, it's technically when any third party is used to continue the abuse. Um, but the most common person that they're using this for is the children in the case. Um, Abuse and neglect of children, that increases when there's separation because the protective parent is no longer a buffer. And so if the child is saying, no, they're having a fit, um, the protective parent would do everything and anything to keep the child quiet, calm, whatever it might be, so that the abusive partner is not going to harm them, right? We can't annoy someone who's abusive. We can't, you know have them be obligated to do these things because they might be really harmful. Um, and so when there is that separation um, and they don't have access to you or your client anymore, they have access to these kids and they know that they can hurt you the most that way. Um, and then custody as a means of control um, and then the discard. So the discard in this arena is they will fight tooth and nail to get 50-50 custody or to get full, you know, decision-making, or they would like full, you know, parenting time and for the survivor to have um, supervised visitation or whatever it might mean. Once they are awarded 50-50 or even more than that, they very often do not show. So it was about the fight. And so who does that actually harm? 
if your children want to still see their other parent, it really harms the kids. It harms you in the sense that they will then turn it around on you and say that you are alienating the children. And unfortunately that works. Like you would think like, no, no, you could show evidence and documentation. It actually works unless you do some of the things I'm talking about later. So using the children is um, the most common tool, the most common weapon and is financial abuse. So financial abuse doesn't end. In fact, it gets worse once they've left. So if they have the idea that their partner is going to leave, they will start removing them. If they had access to credit cards, if they had access to bank accounts, all of a sudden they're removed from them and they can do that um, without much problem by calling their bank. Um, they might stop paying bills. Right. They feel pretty invincible. Like it's not that, you know, taxes, who needs to pay those? Um, but it actually harms both of you if you're together and have joint money. And so you will accrue debt. You'll, you know, accrue poor credit, which means guess what? You're trying to leave and trying to get an apartment and you can't. Um, they might quit their jobs, become underemployed or retire. That's actually a really, um, there's some sort of, wave of that happening in my world is um, all of these abusive men are retiring early. I, that's their, their tactic. And so it is really hard. And I've actually, several people asked questions about this, maybe not retiring, but this piece in the questions. And so it really is damaging because the way systems are set up, the way our um, child abuse or not child abuse, sorry, our um, child support is set up. You put your stuff in a calculator. They use your taxes, right? So what if you have your own business? I have my own business. Guess what? You can hide lots of money. You can hide money. You can do so many things so that these calculations don't work. And so there, there you go. Hiding money, um, refusing to pay child support, um, stalk you or harass you at your workplace or at the target partner's workplace. And so they're fired. Um, and then using the family court system, again, that's my area of expertise. That's where um, the majority of my clients, if they're going to be, that's where they become bankrupt. So, right, the average cost of divorce in our world is, I think, anywhere between 10 and 16,000 for a, like a normal divorce. When it goes to a high conflict divorce, which is just high conflict is domestic violence by a different name, um, it's in the hundreds of thousands. So are your clients have to, are they going to have to go pro se, which means they're representing themselves or do they have the finances to hire a good attorney? And that's a big deal. Like a good attorney that understands um, and who's not going to just, you know, charge them to charge them and then agree to whatever, or are fearful of, you know, your partner's attorney or things like that. So that's where it mostly is. But what I was saying before is you're going to hear things or they're going to hear things like, well, we can't make your person work. We can't make your partner work. We can't make them go back to work, right? They have autonomy too. And so some of the things that you can do, if you, if your person hasn't left yet, or they have just recently left and they haven't been removed from all the things is having documentation of maybe what were their hours before you filed divorce or before you separated? What did those hours look like? Did they have a full 40 hour, you know, work week? And now all of a sudden they can only get 28 hours, right? So having documentation, documentation of pay stubs, documentation of what they made before and what they can't or and what they're making now. And then being able to, um, you can get like a vocational assessment for them to show what they could be making. I will tell you, it's usually lower than what they would actually make. But if they're not working at all, that's a good way to go. So um, those are some things that that you can do within this. And I wish we, you know, we had hours and hours to talk about it, but we don't. Legal abuse. If your person shares children together, this will most likely happen. It is enabled. Post-separation abuse is enabled in our family court system as it is. Um, they will file repeated motions, adjournments. They will continue hearings. They will lie on the stand and like, Naive me, when I first was started doing this, 
um, I had this like belief that if you lied on the stand, that was like the biggest thing. And you would be held, you know, in perjury and contempt of court and all these things Not in family court. No, they don't actually care. Um, so yeah, they say, oh, well, he said, she said, everyone lies. My people don't lie. They are petrified to lie on the stand. They are petrified to get in trouble. So they don't lie on the stand, but their people do. Don't tell your people, and I'm not an attorney, so I do want to point that out. I'm not an attorney, so I cannot give you legal advice, but tell your people do not lie on the stand. Um, they'll hide things. So if you have to, if they have to provide their financials, are they going to provide the things? No, they are not, right? Um, they're going to make you work a hundred times harder. Why is that? Because they can make you do it. It's going to make you spend a lot more money. It's going to cause you a lot more stress. You might, your, your person might want to give up. That's the goal. Continue harming you in whatever way I can with the hopes you'll give up. So we really need to, again, this is like horrible Debbie Downer stuff, but there are things you can do and you can help with. Um, but it is important to know the stats. So mothers alleging abuse lost custody of their children in a range between 23 to 56% of the time. Whereas when fathers allege abuse, they lose custody between 11 to 33% of the time. Okay. So this is this belief that women become vengeful and they lie about domestic violence, sexual abuse, and um, physical abuse of the children where the, the stats, we know that is not true. Um, so even if males allege abuse, they will also risk losing custody. It's like mind boggling, right? And then contrary to popular belief, courts do award sole or joint custody to fathers in 70% of the cases. And who are these dads that are like, no, they shouldn't see their dads. Guess what? They're the ones who batter the mamas. They're twice as likely to seek sole custody of their children. So parents who are not abusive, specifically dads who are not abusive, are not fighting for sole custody because they believe that their kids need their mama, right? So we need to know these things because this is what our people are going to experience. So I'm going to talk about it because this is the most polarizing thing in the domestic violence family court world right now. Um, and it's actually a really big problem in the sense that um, advocates that are actually working towards the same thing are no longer willing to work with each other because of this word, parental alienation. So I'm going to talk about it. I want you to sit back. If you have really strong thoughts about parental alienation, um, I want you to just sit back and listen with curiosity. I'm just going to ask you, what can I learn from this? Even if Sybil does not change my thoughts on the thing, what can you learn? How can you listen with curiosity? It's really, in my opinion, the only way um, advocates in this space as a whole are going to be able to make change, right? Everyone's like, we need you know, court reform. Yes, we do. We're not going to get it because we're not working together. So that's just my, right? This is my soapbox right here. Um, not just parental alienation, but us working together. So the myth of parental alienation. So the term parental alienation, and I don't have time to go into a full like educational seminar on this, but this theory was coined by uh, Richard Gardner. He was, I believe, a psychiatrist. I don't, I think he's a psychiatrist. Um, and it has been rejected by the APA, the AMA, and the WHO. And it's because of its origins and um, its origins are gross. So I'm gonna share just a quote for you that is a quote by Richard Gardner um, when discussing parental alienation and where it comes from. Um, it came from working with um, perpetrators of child sexual abuse. So it is because of how our society overreacts to pedophilia that children suffer. So this is the person who has coined the term parental alienation. And there's a reason why it has been rejected. Um, it is, however, consistently used successfully in family court 
by abusive partners. It is the most successful, the most successful thing that an abusive parent can use in family court. It consistently muddies the waters so that the judge has to look at it, partly because they're not well trained in what this actually is. Um, and it it just works. It's really sad. Um, there are so many reasons a child would reject a parent, right? So a child will reject a parent if they witness domestic violence, harm of their safe parent pretty often, um, if they've experienced harm, or um, if one parent is not involved in child-related things when they are babies, the child will not develop a good relationship with that parent. They will not have a secure attachment. So if they're not doing diaper changes, baths, um, attending doctor's appointments, if they're not playing, if they're not holding, if they're not soothing, they're not going to have a great relationship with this child. So there are many other reasons why a child would reject a parent, um, but it is believed that it is because one parent is unconsciously alienating or doing it overtly to the child. Now you are probably, if you are here and you have experienced what you feel like is parental alienation, I am not discounting that at all. I am not discounting that at all. So what are you experiencing? You are experiencing domestic violence by proxy. So like I mentioned before, it's the use of someone else, your child to continue to abuse. So the difference and why it is most likely this versus that is because it is a pattern of behavior where a parent with a history of using abuse tactics, so domestic violence, intimidation, they've used the child as a substitute when they do not have access to the former partner, there is a pattern and it does not start during at separation. And when you look at parental alienation and that language, it only starts at separation. And so if you have experienced, I mean, think about if your people have been threatened with, I'm going to take your children from you. You are so crazy. No judge is going to give you these kids if you leave. I'm going to kill your children if we leave. I'm going to kill you. Any of those threats or if they've abused the children when you've lived with them, if they have groomed the children in some way while you were together with them, this is domestic violence by proxy. They are already doing it. So we need to look at patterns before you've left to know what you've experienced. And um, parental alienation is described by Gardner. It's like this unconscious process that, uh, I say protective parent, that's not how it is deemed in the parental alienation industry. Um, and it is an industry and that's a whole nother story um, that this parent is unconsciously making this child reject the parent by acting scared, by feigning fear, by coaching, by doing these things. Um, and Yes, children do feel, if, if your person is anxious, your kid's going to feel it. Their child's going to feel it. Absolutely. But it doesn't. And in my experience, I've been a, a play therapist since 2008. Um, uh, parental alienation syndrome isn't real. I have never seen it in the way it is described by Gardner. I have seen it in domestic violence by proxy all the time. So what can we make of this? So again, what can you do to help your people not just scare the poop out of them is you're going to help them look for patterns within the relationship prior to the relationship ending. You're going to look, is there evidence of coercive control or other forms of domestic violence within this relationship? Is there grooming? And people freak out when I use the term grooming for domestic violence and she'll, yes, it is grooming. It's grooming behavior. Um, you're going to check yourself on gender bias. Right. So this can happen from a female parent to a male parent. And here's here's actually how it looks different. And this is why it's 
like, oh, I want to bang my head up against a wall. So the behaviors or the statements that a male perpetrator is going to use is they're gatekeeping my children. They are not allowing me to see them. They're trying to keep them away from my family. They're preventing me from going to school functions. Um, They're going to use these kinds of things. Females who are perpetrators of are going to allege sexual abuse. They are going to allege physical abuse. And so these are the differences of of kind of what it looks like, right? And so this small, tiny percentage of women, I'm gonna put it out there, who are falsely accusing because they are perpetrators of, and they know that a judge is gonna look at it, um, they are going to make false reports of that. It is a tiny percentage, but that tiny percentage is affecting everyone else, right? And so, um, Parental alienation doesn't actually go the other way and it doesn't actually work the other way. So it's really interesting when you look at that. So female perpetrators of abuse, they don't typically go the the parental alienation route. They can, but it doesn't work the same way in court. That is due to gender bias in court. Um, So know that these terms are gonna be used incorrectly. They just will be. And we need to look at, as professionals in this space, we need to actually read the research and what are the numbers? How many subjects do they have? Has this research been peer reviewed, right? Um, What is their language? So in the research that actually looks kind of good on on parental alienation, their definition of parental alienation is actually domestic violence by proxy. So we really need to know. And then what are the problems with this language? is because so many do not subscribe to the term domestic violence. If they have not been physically abused, we have these misconceptions that it's like a young, uneducated woman, um, you know, like six kids in a trailer, child on hips, smoking a cigarette. And that's clearly not it. So if these women or, or men, right, they don't, I'm not a victim of domestic violence. They're not going to subscribe to the term domestic violence by proxy. Makes no sense to them. So that term domestic violence by proxy is not a good term either, but that term has been around forever. And it actually is what it is because you're looking at the patterns, not just like, oh, court happens, separation. All of a sudden this mom is doing this. Um, so this, I also want to point out again, it's Debbie Downer stuff, making sure I don't forget things in my notes over here. Um, is your client unfriendly? That is actually a legal term that has been used when (laughs) your client is not cooperative in court. So research shows that when women report domestic violence and strongly advocate for themselves in court, they are deemed unfriendly and have worse outcomes. Unfriendly means uncooperative, um, not a good co-parent, basically not subscribing to what the court wants them to do. That's unfriendly. Um, Protection order. So advocates, this is something really important to help your people. If you are helping them get orders of protection and they're going to be in family court, um, they will oftentimes be seen as unfriendly by the court. And thus many times clients are bullied by attorneys, mediators, judges to modify them. Yes. An order of protection is going to make transitioning for visitation harder. Sure is. And guess what? That's not the victim's problem or fault. It's like, Hey buddy, probably don't hurt people. Probably don't be abusive. And, but that's not what it looks like in family court. So what you can do for your people is let them know how to speak to orders of protection in family court, how to help them not feel doubt about their order of protection, help them remember why they got their order of protection. And then again, we talked about before helping them contact law enforcement when it's broken, not if it's broken, when it's broken, even if it is ring doorbell about the sprinklers, sending a message over um, text via talking parents or our family wizard or whatever it is. So 
they need to report these. So, okay. So those are all the just like horrible Debbie Downer things like, oh my gosh, our world is a disaster. Our family court system is a disaster. It is, but there are things you can do. I am not someone that's like, well, we have to sit back and wait till um, family court is reformed. Okay. That process, I'm part of that process. I help with legislation and things like that. This takes forever and it's a total pain in the tush. And if lobby lobbyists, the other direction have lots of money, it's a real uphill battle. So yes to court reform, but that's not going to help your people right now. So what can you do to help your clients, to help your people that you're working with? I've spoken to it some, but um, here's some more specific things. So this was asked, and I'm so glad it was asked in um, several of the questions of, do we need to help our people continue to safety plan after they've left? And not just like the that short period of time after they've left, but kind of further down the line. And the answer is yes. So even if you're not working with them, it's really helpful to let them know, you know, if there's a negative court, a negative court outcome, or your partner has a perceived loss of something, court, financial, whatever it might be, there is a higher risk that they will harm you. That doesn't, again, mean physical harm. That might mean physical harm. So if you are able, like myself, to work with people over the you know, years, we have to constantly be assessing the level of risk, have safety planning, know when those court hearings are, because if it does not go the way of the perpetrator, they will be angry and their level of abuse or intensity of abuse will increase. So we have to continue to assess, continue to safety plan with them. Um, Clearly safety plan around any of the high risk behaviors. If there's been an increase in stalking an increase in threats, um, if your person has that like gut sense, like oh, something is not right. I've seen this car on my cul-de-sac like three times and they've never been there. I know the people who live in my cul-de-sac and that's not one of their cars. We need to listen to our survivors. We need to listen to them because they know, right. And giving them same, giving them that autonomy. They are the expert. They know, um, there are downloadable safety plans. I think there are some on domesticshelters.org. I think <laughs> I'm like, did I put them in the references and resources? I don't remember if I put them in the references and resources, but if I didn't, I'll make sure I get those to Ashley. Um, and then there's some tech safety videos. So we got a lot of questions about tech safety. Um, that is not really my area of expertise. I can just barely do like a Zoom and a PowerPoint and have share it with you all. <laughs> it's not my skill. Um, so myself, I did. Um, uh, I guess a training, a webinar or whatever with a tech guru, um, who is, does tech safety. So I did, um, a webinar with that person and then domestic shelters did one literally like, I think it was like three weeks after mine went live too. So, um, Ashley's going to share those with you. Uh, mine's on YouTube. I think theirs is probably just on their webinar platform in domesticshelters.org. If, your clients are anxious about this um, and they think that they're being stalked. They think their, their um, computer is being monitored. Oh my gosh, it's crazy the things that can be monitored. They believe that the GPS on their kid's phone or their kid's watch or their kid's Fitbit is in use, probably is. Um, so those are um, resources that you can go to. I want to talk about the four P's to protect yourself. This is a whole webinar in and of itself, but I'm going to just go through it really briefly. So what you can help your clients do is be proactive, be prepared, be able to predict and be able to present. And so what do I mean by that? So being proactive is getting documentation. Okay. We're going to talk about that next in a little more detail. Um, getting everything ready, knowing what they need to do, Right. Becoming prepared, edu getting educated on all the things. Maybe they've never been to a family court hearing. Maybe if you have space, you sit with them in a family court hearing where their judge, the judge they're going to be in front of is present. Um, that's so helpful for, for so many of the, the women that I've worked with just to head to court and see what it's like, um, see what their, their person is like, help them be prepared for their attorney and what to expect. Help them be prepared by getting support 
all around them, right? So being proactive, being protect, prepared, the piece that is actually one of the most helpful in this entire post-separation abuse is helping them predict what will happen. There is a script. I call it the narcissistic blueprint. And your person knows their partner better than anyone. If they are regulated enough, they can predict the things that their partner will say in court. Like you can say, like, these are the top things that, you know, a narcissist might say in court, which is parental alienation, number one, the fact that you're not mentally stable, that's one, you're using substances, um, you know, alcohol or, or um, drugs, you're only after money, um, you're the abuser, right? Those are really common ones. Ask them, what do you think your partner will go, go for? What are they going to say? And I guarantee they will know. They will know. And you can ask them follow-up questions about that. Well, have they ever threatened to take your kids from you? Right? So following up with those open-ended questions, using your person as an expert. And then I say this, and I say this with the most love, um, no judgment, but you're going to help them present to professionals so they don't look like crazy people. Right? That presentation, if they are looking unstable, it just fits the narrative. And should they look unstable? Yes, they should. They have trauma. They have PTSD. They have lots going on, so much anxiety, but it's really part of our job to help them not look crazy. So documentation, documentation is key. It is your friend. So can they get pictures, screenshots, emails, things that have an IP address, things that have a time stamp, um, right? What can they have? to basically refute any false narratives with evidence. That's the goal. So a co-parenting app and communication, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. They need to have one. If they have kids together, they, they do not have the text, do not have just email, do not have those things. They need one of the co-parenting apps. They are court admissible. Um, and they are one of the best, like Brett, they're one of the best sources of documentation. Um, you can use an, a court approved vault, like the victim's voice. Um, I know that they work with domestic shelters quite frequently and then to have them use a separate journal or a planner or a calendar, like with the squares, um, as opposed to their journal, because if they would like to use things from their personal journal in court to show, oh, this day I was abused and this is what happened. And they want that to be as evidence the whole journal could be subpoenaed. And then if their journal, they ever talk about suicidal ideation, um, hating their children because their children were, you know, excuse me, but a-holes that day. I have kids, right? Any of that, and there it goes, it's in court and it can help their narrative. So separate journal or planner. Um, one of the best things of documentation um, that I have seen is um, like one of my, my people, one of my, it was actually a grandparent handed me this huge stack. I mean, like not even kidding, like huge stack of papers. And I was like, what am I supposed to do with them? Well, these are all dates of, um, when kid went to the, the nurse or the clinic at school. Okay. I'm not going to have time to look through and check the dates and be like, oh yeah, that's around a visit or whatever it might be. Right. Like a judge is not going to do that. Never going to do that. So you're going to save your person time and money if they hire an attorney by getting a calendar, right? Like with the squares. And this is just an example, but they are going to outline the visitation or color in those squares of visitation. Boop, those are all blue. And then they're going to take their, that huge stack of papers. Um, and they're going to, in a different color, outline the square in red every time they went to the clinic at school with a migraine. Mm -hmm. And guess what happened when this person did that? The Friday before visits, red. The two days after every visit, red. Other days, not red, right? And that's a wonderful visual representation. Like, boop, this is easy, concise, <laughs> right? A judge is not going to go through all that paperwork and you don't want your attorney to go through all that paperwork because that's a lot of money. Okay, sharing realistic expectations. They need to know the possible behaviors. We talked about that all along using the survivor as an expert, what way, what behaviors can they predict? And then you can help them find ways to mitigate or manage each one of those. Helping with mindset um, that they can do this. They have more power than they think. 
that they have in this. And so using them as the expert really gives them that sense of autonomy, um, gives them a sense of self-worth, and then also balancing hope with realistic expectations. Um, it is helpful and it's hard for them to stomach knowing that it is possible. Um, and this is somewhat state dependent too. So you need to know your geographic area, like what's going on. Um, but what does the family court system look like there? So here in Colorado, it is a 50-50 state. Unless you have like some legit like bruises on your face and your children have bruises and documented abuse, the first goal is 50-50. That's what our court system does here. And so we need to know that to prepare. And then we need to be able to prepare with either myself, um, advocates, with um, attorneys, right? How can they best mitigate that? What can they use to show that fear? What is the best plan moving forward? Again, remember it is, if you don't have long-term with them, what is their next best step? Okay, I can tell you this is the one of the most important pieces of, of um, healing from this is your person will heal faster. It will accelerate their healing when their support system is increased by safe people. So something you can do as an advocate is really help foster relationships, help them find safe family and friends, help them find, a, I, I say trauma-informed therapist, but that's actually not enough. Um, they need to know about um, domestic violence. They need to know about those cluster B personality disorders. They need to know how that presents. And that's harder to find. I'm well aware. Um, you know, getting them with, maybe you're an advocate at a shelter. Can they get a court appointed advocate as well? Like where can we just bolster their support system? Can we help them find an attorney? Um, can we help them get into a support group, into a community? Um, what can we do? This is literally the reason I started um, the Rising Beyond community is because I saw how much quicker my people healed when they had safe people around them. Um, so that is, this is a huge thing that you can do and it is of utmost importance. Okay, so this is a slide with so much on it. I'm keeping my eyeballs on the time. Like I'm trying to like boop, 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 get through things. Um, and we are going to like hopefully flood you with some resources and websites and things after so that you can go further your, their, your learning later. Co-parenting with boundaries. So if they share children, guess what? They don't get to like in criminal court, we're like, you know, order of protection, don't have contact with this person. In family court, we're like, actually, can you talk every day? <laughs> right? It makes no sense. So they will have to co-parent. Um, I actually, I use the term co-parent because that is what looks good in court. So tell them don't use the term parallel parent in court because they'll get dinged. But that's actually what they're going to do is parallel parent. Um, but have them get a co-parenting app. There are some that are free. Um, they don't have all the bells and whistles and you won't get all the notifications and things like that. But it is really important because that is going to be your, your bread and butter of documentation and to refute that you specifically are not alienating your children from them. So there are ways to communicate on those co-parenting apps with their co-parent that will really help refute that specific thing, will really help um, show the court with evidence, not like I'm in court and it's he said, she said. These are ways to not have the he said, she said, like get out of that game. So your person is going to be triggered every time they hear the ding or the notification or they read contact, if they are allowed contact, right? If they have an order of protection, things look different. But this is for if they have contact, they're going to have to co-parent. You can help them by slowing everything down. So they hear the ding, their you know, gut is in their throat right now, the heart's in their throat. What can they do? They can read it. Do they have to respond right then? No. Nope. Not everything's an emergency, right? And if they slow everything down when they are communicating, they will be able, more better able to respond instead of react. You can give them information on communication 
lifestyle. So um, I call it speckled rock if it's co-parenting versus so gray rock is you are going to be as boring as gray rock. Yes, no, not like basics. So um, you are going to not engage. You can even kind of do no contact with the gray rock. If you can do that, hallelujah, you will actually be able to heal faster. If you are co-parenting and in family court, you are not going to gray rock because you will look unfriendly. I call it speckled rock. Um, Tina Swithin, who is really well known in the space, she calls it um, yellow rock. In Colorado, if you saw yellow rock, it'd be gold. So it'd be really interesting. So that's why I never used that term. And I came with speckled rock. You're going to speckle in some niceties. You're going to engage in a way. And the best way to speckle rock, in my opinion, is to use Biff which means you're going to help them communicate brief, informative, friendly, and firm. The friendly piece is really hard for so many of my people to stomach because you shouldn't have to have contact with them at all. And you do. Um, And so that's annoying in and of itself. And it is so aggravating. But if you are in family court, you need to appear kind of cooperative and friendly and that you can be a good co-parent. So helping them respond, right? They're going to send you this word salad message with like this long. And there's one question about the children in the whole message. You only have to respond to that question. You don't have to respond to the random, right? That's the goal is to get you all worked up. So you respond like a crazy person. Then they have that documentation that you're a crazy person in court. So brief, informative, friendly, and firm. You are going to tell them to stick to the court orders. If you give an inch, they will take a mile and then they can go back and be like, oh, but you weren't so worried about the court orders. So a really good canned response, which is another one, if they can come up with, you can help them come up with three or four responses that they can use that fit Biff and they can kind of fit different situations, you know, like, thank you for the information. Um, Our visitation time will be blah, right? But so say they are like, oh, you know, I really need to change our time. Can um, you switch parenting time from this weekend to next weekend, blah, 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 blah. And you're like inside, like "Mm, so mad because your person is like, no, like they're trying to ruin my, like I have this girl's trip come in and they knew it and they're trying to switch and whatever, trying to ruin that. Um, Stick to the court orders. I look forward to the day that we can collaborate and communicate effectively around visitation. At this time, I am going to stick to the court order um, from March 20, whatever today is, March 23rd, um, written by judge so-and-so that states our visitation is X, Y, Z. Thank you. Boop. So you could just say no, that's great rock, but we're gonna not just say no. So if you can help them come up with canned responses, it will be really helpful. And then this is a little bit longer term work, but how can they set up consequences or boundaries that have consequences attached? That's really scary. That's really hard. And if they are struggling with self-worth, um, that's going to be a really tough area for them. So anything you can do with helping with boundaries, um, that is helpful, but if, but they have to have some consequences for them to actually work. All right. So you can, and it is so important in those first 30 to 90 days to help them regulate themselves. They are going to need tools in their tool belt to regulate their nervous system. They're going to need it to respond to emails, prepare for court, right? Like think about that, that first day. So their person was arrested and that next day they have to go to court for that that hearing where, right. That is like one of the worst and scariest days in their lives. How can you help them regulate? So the thing in that you, you may have just met this person right in the witness room. You may not even know this person from anyone else. You can co-regulate with them. It's not on here, but, um, it's important. So if you can bring your calm, right and you're with them and you're eye contacting and you're doing all the things. So they may be talking a mile a minute, blah, 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 right? And you're going to talk slower and you're going to really use that co-regulation to help them. Or maybe they are so um, frozen 
you might pick up the energy a little bit and say, Hey, I'm with you. You're going to be okay. Let's do this. Hey, let's take a walk around just this little room. Cause I know, <laughs> or let's take a walk to the vending machine. I've been in those witness rooms before, um, you know, waiting to head into court or whatever. And so getting their body moving so that they are not just completely broken. You can, those are things that you can do easily. They're going to have to testify right there. They might. So this is the long haul. So they need some skills. So what are some skills? Um, so how can you manage trauma responses? Um, so the goal, again, like I said, is to help them heal and to help them present well if they have to speak to professionals. Um, and the healing process and the court process, those are not the same. They do not line up ever. Um, so you're kind of going both ways, like helping heal, helping them present, helping them heal, helping them present. Um, so here's some things that you can do again over, you got 30 days with them. You've got 90 days with them, help them with mindfulness. And how can you do that? You can use everyday things. So you don't even have to tell them like, we're doing mindfulness today, right? If you're with them in shelter and they're washing dishes, you can comment of like, wow, the way the water feels over my hands when it's cold, X, Y, Z, I feel this way. Or you just take some deep breaths when you notice they are like shoulders raised, right? And noticing like, wow, like I notice when my body is super tense. If I do this kind of breathing, it really helps. You can do it with food. So one of the things that I do in my office, so I was trained to do this with raisins who likes raisins? Nobody wants a raisin. I use Hershey's kisses because who doesn't want a Hershey's kiss, right? But if you can, if they are really struggling with being in the moment and being mindful, you give them a Hershey's kiss and ask them questions about their experience. What does it feel like? What does it taste like? Do they have memories of? Clearly, if they have a memory of a really bad memory about Hershey's kisses, um, because it ha- there was an incident around the holidays and there were Hershey's kisses. Okay. So maybe Hershey's kisses isn't good, but finding every d- things that they are going to experience every day to bring them in the moment, um, square breathing, it actually helps slow your heart rate down. So if you don't know what square breathing is, um, I use fours, you can use different numbers, but I like to use fours. So they're going to breathe in for four, hold for four, blow the breath out. Like you're blowing through a, a straw for four is really helpful. And I'll tell you why in a minute and hold for four before you breathe in again. So getting them to do some of that square breathing will actually lower their heart rate. So the only reason I know these things and the blowing out through a straw, like forcefully through a straw, because I used to have a heart condition that I had to slow my heart rate down on its own. And these are some of the things that I had to do to try and slow my heart rate down. And so square breathing and the active exhale lowers your heart rate. So you can give them that information, like, especially if you have, um, like some of my teen boys are like, this is stupid. I'm not breathing with you, Sybil. Um, I'll talk to them like, well, what do you do right before, maybe they're in track right before a race, right? They let out that air or how many times did you sigh today? Guess what? Sighing is nature's way of slowing your heart rate down. (sighs) So these are things that you can do all the time. You can give them education, psycho ed on trauma. Um, There's tons of resources you can use for that. You can do a grounding exercise with them. This is similar to mindfulness. It brings them back into the moment, Um, check in time. So I'm going to just go through it really fast. Um, You can ask them what are five things they see, have them state it. What are four things they feel? My tush in the seat, my feet on the ground, my sweater on my body, right? Um, What are three things you hear? So this one, um, just be aware that they will maybe be hypervigilant and that may cause some anxiety. So if you notice that they jump anytime they hear anything, don't ask them about what they hear. That's going to cause them more anxiety. So then you're going to really stick to the seeing and feeling. Um, oftentimes, once I get through the what they hear, very rarely do I have to do smell and taste, um, but sometimes that's helpful. And if they still really are you know, like really rigid, that's when you're going to give them the Hershey's kiss, right? Because then they can taste something and they can be focused there. 
Um, improving their polyvagal tone. I'm going to go through this because you you might be like, what the heck is that? Um, this is probably the number one thing that I do with clients or that I think is helpful with clients. Um, this is a little bit longer term process, but really helpful because there are things you can do um, even shorter term to do this and then get them set up with a therapist so that they can start some trauma healing modalities. Um, there's a lot of them. Um, and this, the reason that you really need to be aware of, um, does this therapist understand domestic violence, cluster B personality disorders, things like that is because some of them like, like EMDR is just one that if they have criminal court coming up, guess what? They should not be doing EMDR. They can do all the resourcing and things before, but they should not be reprocessing um, because it could affect testimony. So things like that, we just need to know. Um, And all trauma modalities, this is what's sad, are for when the person is safe, right? Trauma happened, now they're safe, we do trauma work. That's not what your people are going to be experiencing. They're still not safe. Their children may not be safe. So trauma modalities have their limits because how do you heal when you're still being abused? That is the million dollar question, really. Um, And it is really hard. Can someone be fully healed if they're experiencing abuse continued? I don't know. Questions out on that one, right? Like verdicts out. Um, but I wanted to explain what is polyvagal theory? What does that mean to me? And why am I going to use it? So I'm talking about your nervous system. I'm talking about your lizard brain, right? That goes on and off when you don't want it to. So at the top is ventral vagal. When you feel safe, secure, and connected, that's the goal. We want to be there, right? The sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight. And that's one step down on this nervous system ladder. Dorsal vagal is when you're in freeze, when you're disconnected, shut down, right? Fawning is a whole nother thing. That's a whole nother webinar. So what is polyvagal tone? It is the speed at which someone can regulate back to feeling safe, secure, and connected. So those exercises that I told you to just do can help them move back up the ladder, right? So your person It's like sitting around or whatever, and they hear a scary noise, boom, they're in sympathetic nervous system. They're in fight or flight, right? They're listening, they're hearing. And if maybe they think the threat is too much, they're going to freeze. They're going to completely shut down. So this seems silly, maybe if you don't understand this world, but getting that ding of a notification on the email will send someone into fight, flight, or freeze. Sounds crazy but it absolutely does. If you're a survivor with me and you get those notifications, you know what I'm talking about. So what are the things that you can do to help them regulate themselves back to feeling safe, secure, and connected? Some of it is movement and exercise, right? I said, like, if they were in dorsal vagal, really shut down, you're going to take just kind of a slow walk, maybe in sympathetic nervous system when they're in fight or flight, they're going to go for a jog. And if it's really bad, they're going to take a kickboxing class because you're going to match that level of intensity of the anxiety with the level of exercise. Mindfulness helps. Feeling grounded helps. The number one thing that helps, however, in this ladder is being with safe people. That is the thing that helps the most. And that co-regulation helps the most. So I wanted to bring that up because it's something that When you're looking at post-separation abuse and it's like, oh, we can heal. We can fully heal. No, no, actually healing is going to be so much longer during post-separation abuse because you're continuing to be abused. So last thing you can do, I think it's the last thing you know, (laughs) is helping them remember their why. Remember their why. Why are they doing this? Right. When you can put that in their face all the time it will help them with that mindset and to continue. Um, And instead of doing my wrap up video, which I, or slide, which I can, I know we have some questions because I just, I read like, I don't know, 60 questions this week already. (laughs) (laughs) What do you have for me, Ashley? Yes. Yeah. Let's dive right in. No time to waste. Excuse me. Let me clear my voice here. 
Um, so I'm just going to start from the top. Hannah's been organizing these questions uh, throughout the presentation. Um, the first one was something you mentioned early on, which is the term flying monkeys. I mentioned yeah. that this is a new term for them. Um, can yeah. you just talk about who the flying monkeys are and what they yes. do? Yes. Yeah, so a flying monkey, it's a very visual term. Um, a flying monkey is, if you think about the Wizard of Oz, if you were old enough to have watched the Wizard of Oz, the Wicked Witch of the West had her creepy, they're so scary, creepy flying monkeys that did her bidding. So flying monkeys are anyone that is in the ecology of the abuser that abuses, you know, through that domestic violence by proxy, continues to help the abuse. So it could be someone that is, um, they don't even realize they're a flying monkey, right? So think someone at church and the abuser comes in and is like, gosh, I'm just so worried about her. She's just not well. I mean, I'm really worried about her mental health. Oh my gosh, this churchgoer is like, oh, God, I'm going to check in with her. Oh, honey, I heard you're doing so, you're struggling. And then they're telling the community, gosh, so and so is really struggling right now with her mental health. Right? False narrative, boom, and other people are doing it. It could be someone really overt, like a friend monitoring you on Facebook or a friend monitoring you at your house. So it can be um, bigger or, you know, more overt or more covert. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, next question is, what are some examples of acceptable consequences? Uh, I found that my clients want to feel they have some power in the situation, but also don't want to be penalized. Yes, it, yes, it is so hard. So the consequences may be about communication, usually in this, or about visitation time. So say the court order pickup time is at 5 p.m. on Friday. So you like get your kids all in and maybe they don't want to go. And so it's like this horrible experience and you're waiting at the Starbucks or at the Walmart or at the police station or whatever. And you're hanging out in the car, 5, 505, 510. You've texted or you've done the co-parenting app and they have not shown. What time are you going to leave? right? So sometimes you need to have that court ordered or you need to have that really specified. So if you're talking with people, find the loopholes of these court orders and parenting plans, because they're going to find every loophole, but it would be, you know, the message may be like, we're here at our, you know, approved drop-off point. Um, we will stay here until 520. Um, if you're not here, I don't hear from you by that time we are leaving. And then you leave right? And why are you doing it in your co-parenting app? Because then it's court admissible and you had texted them or, or messaged them at 505, 510 and 515 with the I am leaving, right? And then it's all documented. Um, so that might be one. It may be um, setting a boundary, which doesn't seem like you're, because it's not an overt boundary, but they send you like nine mil, you know, they're like 900 word essay of how you're such a crappy parent and how horrible and crazy you are and blah, blah, blah. And the one question is like, do they have a dentist appointment? A boundary is only answering about the dentist appointment, right? And that also will help you look good because you're not getting into it. You're not all up in their business. So I hope that helps. It is hard because it's so nuanced, right? Yeah. Every situation is a little different. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, referring to the, the Vegas reaction you had kind of covered here at the end, does it vary between children and adults? And what are the differences in how children and adults experience stress? Yeah, so um, our vagus nerve is gonna be our vagus nerve all the time. Our nervous system's gonna react that way, but it, it might look different, right? So where adults are a little bit more, hopefully, aware of um, their reactions to things, kids may not be. So um, for kids, more often I see um, aggression um, when they are in fight or flight, whereas very rarely are my survivor um, clients, they very rarely show, do it through aggression, but kids very often will do it through aggression. Maybe they are just crabby and you're like, is this just crabby or are they completely dysregulated? Um, they may be the ones that are actually missed the most are the ones that are quiet and invisible. So you'll get the, the kiddos who go you know, they go very quickly from um, ventral vagal, they'll go down fight or flight. And then they're like, nope, freeze. I'm going to go hide in my room. So the reason that they're like, they're harder, or they're um, trickier is because you don't see the dysregulation because they're not naughty. 
they're not being crazy kids all over the place and like talking back and being that person. Um, so it's really important to know that, um, they might have problems eating. Guess what? You might have tummy troubles. If you're a survivor, that is the most common thing. So that is common with both, right? You're in that fight or flight and your stomach is a disaster. Um, so there are a lot of similarities, but it really is a tuning to your kids to see, are they just crabby because they haven't eaten or are they dysregulated for another reason? Yeah. Very helpful. Uh, next question, I think is probably on, on everyone's mind is, uh, is there anything that we can do to work better with CPS and guardian ad litems? Um, in my experience, these offices seem to be working against my clients and in favor of the abuser continuing the abuse after separation. Yeah, this is actually, I'm glad you mentioned this question because it is one of the number one things I really help with like mental health professionals that do this. The number one thing you can help them with is developing a relationship with the professionals in their case. So your person is probably like a shell, kind of broken, or they act like an angry, crazy person. And so if they are presenting that way, or because they're so mistrusting, which they should be, right? Like, I'm not like, oh, they don't trust people. No, they should be. They have reason to not trust. But it is of vital importance for them, the survivor, to develop a relationship, a working relationship with whatever professional, the caseworker, um, the visitation person, the GAL, because when they don't, it allows the abuser to completely control the narrative and they're good at it, right? They're like really showy and they can do all of those things. And that is their right love bombing. They're going to love bomb that GAL. They're going to do the thing. And so you helping your person develop a, a good relationship with that um, professional is going to be the number one thing. And then consistency, helping your person be consistent, right? So an abusive person is going to hold their stuff together for as much time as they can hold it together. And then they're going to do what they do and be abusive. Your person can be consistent and they're going to be consistently anxious, but consistency is fine, <laughs> right? So I hope that's helpful because it is, it's a problem. It's really hard. Yeah. No, I think that's great advice. And we're nearing the end of our time together. So I want to just give you a moment to, to have any final thoughts before we wrap things up. Oh my goodness. I know. I, I feel like I threw a lot at you and there's so much there. I get questions on a daily basis, specifically of like how to protect my clients in family court. Like what is going on with family court? Um, so I think honestly, like continued learning, continue learning from your cases is really important. Remembering that your survivor, your people have the knowledge inside them about a lot of these things. Um, and that there are some ways to get involved with family court reform and things like that, but that that process, just it just is a pain in the tush. Honestly, it takes a lot of time um, and it's about money, a lot of it, which is so gross, so gross. Um, so yeah, if I am, again, please reach out to me. Um, I, Ashley knows I have this, but I have a podcast all about these things. So hop on there, listen to my podcast. You can ask me questions and I actually will do podcast episodes about those. So that's awesome. Yes. Please listen to our podcast. I am a huge fan. She does a great job. This is something I know she, you put a lot of time and thought into before you launched it. And I, yes. I was not surprised at the, the quality and the amazing, uh, work that you've done in that space. So um, we'll make sure that there's a link in the shared resources folder for that. Um, but yes, thank you so much, Sybil. This has been a fantastic uh, presentation, so much wonderful information. And also thank you to everyone who tuned in today. We're just so glad that you joined us today. And um, if you are going through this, I do want to stress this, if you're going through this right now and want to speak to a domestic violence advocate in your area, um, please be sure to visit domesticshelters.org forward slash help. Um, there you'll find our searchable database where you can locate the nearest program or shelter in your area uh, where you can connect with a domestic violence advocate. So, um, and then just a quick reminder before we wrap up that the webinar recording, uh, the slides, transcripts, certificate of attendance, uh, and then links to shared resources will be emailed to everyone uh, who logged in within one week. Um, so, and then also if you're a call-in listener, so if you are just picked up the phone and dialed in, you didn't open the Zoom app or, or you aren't on your computer, 
uh, that email to, to let us know, um, to be on our email list to receive those resources is info at domesticshelters.org. So just send us a quick note and let us know and we'll add you to the email list. So with that, we'll go ahead and conclude today's presentation. Thank you so much to everyone who joined and have a wonderful day.